There are a few names that are synonymous with Star Trek, but only a select few are as beloved and respected as Nicholas Meyer. Born Christmas Eve 1945 in New York, Meyer graduated from the University of Iowa with a degree in theater and filmmaking and also wrote film reviews for the campus newspaper. Meyer first gained public attention for his best-selling 1974 Sherlock Holmes novel, The 7% Solution, a story about Holmes confronting his cocaine addiction with the help of Sigmund Freud. He was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for the film. He followed with two additional Holmes novels, The West End Horror and The Canary Trainer. Nicholas Meyer then set his sights on directing. He acquired the rights to Time After Time, the story of H.G. Wells tracking down the serial killer Jack the Ripper through time by using the fabled time machine of Wells' famous story. He would direct the film for Warner Brothers in 1979. In 1982, The Wrath of Khan took the box office by storm and made Star Trek bigger than it ever had been before. Meyer, who directed the film, would go uncredited for his writing contributions, but not unnoticed. In 1983, Nicholas Meyer directed the television film The Day After for ABC, and in 1985, the author-writer-director switched gears to comedy by directing the Tom Hanks and John Candy film The Volunteers. He would come back to the world of Star Trek with Star Trek IV, but only this time as a writer. But he would get back into the director's chair once again after writing Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country and would continue to be a part of the Star Trek legacy, most recently by working on Star Trek Discovery for CBS All Access and being commissioned to write a Khan miniseries. Nicholas Meyer has also written on several other notable projects, both credited and uncredited, for such films as Tomorrow Never Dies, Fatal Attraction, Summer's Bee, Prince of Egypt, The Human Stain, and Elegy. It is our pleasure here at Midnight's Edge and a great honor to get the chance to talk to Nicholas Meyer. Good morning. Now, I know we don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to jump right into the questions. First up, uh, how did the 7% solution come about? Well, uh, I guess in, in my memoir, there's a fairly comprehensive explanation about all this. But when I was in high school, people said to me, oh, your old man's a shrink. Is he a Freudian? And I didn't know. So I asked my father if he was a Freudian, and my father said he's he thought it was a silly question and I said why is it a silly question and he said well because it's no more possible to discuss the history of psychoanalysis without starting with Freud than it is to discuss the history of America's discovery without beginning with Columbus or the Vikings you know but to suppose that nothing has been since the Vikings is to be pretty rigid pretty doctrinaire when a patient comes to see me I listen to what they say, I listen to how they say it, I'm very curious as to what they do not say, I look at their body language, I'm curious if they show up for appointments on time, I'm interested in what they're wearing, I am in short searching for clues from them as to they are not happy. And I said, gee, that sounds like detective work, what you do. And he said, well, it, it's very like detective work. And that's when I suddenly realized who my father always reminded me of, um, because when I was 10 or 11, I had swallowed all Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes stories and uh, gobbled them all up. I realized that my father, and this was not the only occasion, uh, reminded me of Sherlock Holmes. And when he said detective work, I thought, oh, wow. And then I started wondering how much Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, knew about the life and writing of Sigmund Freud. And then I found out they were both doctors. They both died in the same city. They both within nine years of each other. And and uh, Freud was for a time a cocaine user, uh, so was Holmes. And these things all eventually led to my writing my novel. What was it like uh, getting nominated for an Academy Award? I enjoyed every minute of it until I lost. 
How did your directorial debut, Time After Time, come about? Well, it, it came about because it was always my goal to direct. And the way I went about uh, achieving that goal was to tie my directing to a script that somebody wanted badly enough to let me do. This was more or less the same leapfrog method that I had used to become a screenwriter, which was to write a novel that somebody wanted to buy for the movies and then say, well, if you want the book, I have to write the script. Um, and if you want the script, I have to direct the movie. It was a sort of leapfrog uh, strategy. I, again, I, th I think it's covered in the book, but that's the shorthand answer. Speaking of your book, uh, you talk about how it sounded like Warner Brothers really wasn't happy with the film until later down the road, just before it came out and things started to come together. How did you find the confidence to keep going forward after knowing that? Well, in the first place, I, I didn't have an inside track on, you know, the studio had sort of convinced me that they were right. And, and the point is that when you're writing or whether it's a book or a film or painting a painting the artist forfeits whatever objective credentials uh, he might have had by the time it's finished or ready to be shown or read or viewed or whatever you don't know what the hell you've done you have no sense of it at all. I had no sense of it at all. Um, so, again, it, it, it's... Uh, I had showed it, I suppose, to some people, I can't remember it no longer, who were, you know, excited about it. Um, and then I, uh, you know, went to this screening in Woodland Hills, this preview, and was completely felt like I was going to my own execution. Uh, and so I was as bewildered as everybody else involved with the film was that night when it went through the roofs. Just nobody but at that point expected anything like that. And... Uh, I just thought, well, that's the beginning and end of my directing career. Uh, and it turned out, you know, it wasn't the end. It was the beginning. How do you feel about the recent television reboot of Time After Time? I had no involvement with it. And it was terrible. So how were you introduced into the world of Star Trek? I was introduced to Harv Bennett, the producer of the second Star Trek movie, by a mutual friend, a childhood friend, in fact, and Khan was not on the drawing board. She just thought I would get along with Harv Bennett. She was, at the time, an executive at Paramount. They were trying to get a second Star Trek movie and weren't really getting very far with it. And it was really more or less fortuitous all around that Harv and I got along and there had been four previous screenplays of the second Star Trek movie and uh, a fifth draft was coming in and when it came in because uh, I was only being brought on to direct I wasn't being brought on to write and none of these drafts were satisfactory and none of them were related to any other there were simply five disparate attempts to get a second Star Trek film and I read all these drafts and then suggested that perhaps if, if we made a list of things that we liked in each of these drafts big things little things scene sequence plot subplot character whatever that it might be possible to cobble together a sixth script. 
that incorporated as many of these elements, and that's sort of what wound up happening. So speaking of writing the film, you wrote it at a breakneck speed, but you aren't credited for writing it. Now, is that because there was so many scripts before you and so many names and because of the Writer Guild rules that you came so far down the list or what happened there? It was my own doing, which was probably stupid. But basically, when I offered to do this, Harv and his producing partner, Robert Fallon, said, well, gee, if we don't have a script in 12 days, Industrial Light and Magic can't guarantee delivery of the special effects shots in time for the movie to open in June, which I had known nothing about. And, you know, I was sort of young and cocky, and I said, well, let's make the damn list, and I, I'll try to write it in 12 days, but let's just get on with it. And they said, well, we couldn't even make your deal in 12 days. And that's when I said, listen, forget my deal, forget the money, forget the credit, because if we just don't do this right now, there isn't going to be a movie. Obviously, I was going to get directing credit, and I was going to get paid for directing. That had already been agreed upon. But I threw away, for whatever reason, the chance to be paid or credited for writing another Star Trek movie, which, you know, took different story elements and... and put my dialogue all over it and made a, a, an original new movie. And how did that success change things for you going forward? Well, instead of being known as the Sherlock Holmes man, I was known as the Star Trek man until I made the day after, and then I was known as the nuke man. And so there's an enormous temptation, or at least there was, to sort of pigeonhole people. Right. And I was being pigeonholed. It certainly didn't hurt anything. I didn't intend to just write Sherlock Holmes stories. I didn't intend to just write Star Trek movies. But it, it was, I, I think, a probably good addition to my resume that I had done it. Now, you returned to the Star Trek universe not too long after Wrath of Khan with Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, but you didn't direct this time out. You only wrote. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, in a nutshell, I got an emergency call from my friend Dawn Steele, who was running Paramount. My offices were on the Paramount lot throughout this time, and she said, we have a big problem, and we need some help right away. And So I said, what's going on? And she said, well... We have a script for Star Trek IV, and we're throwing it out. We want to start over, but we want to keep the story. So I said, what's the story? And she said, go talk to Harv Bennett and Leonard Nimoy. So I went, and they told me the story about the whale. And they said, you want to read the other script? And I said, God, no. Why would I do that if, if you guys don't like it? And again, it was a rush job because they were you know, set to start shooting in six weeks or so. I can't remember. Right. But I, I divvied up the script with uh, Harv Bennett, and he wrote the parts in outer space at the beginning and the end. And I wrote the parts that were essentially time after time, uh, where time travelers come to San Francisco. And uh, my first line in that script was after they come out of their time travel and somebody says, when are we? <laughs> and Spock says, Judging by the pollution content in the atmosphere, I'd say the late 20th century. So that's when I come in, and I'm there until I get back into outer space, and that's how I wound up doing it. What's your personal favorite Joker gag in Star Trek for? Well, just off the top of my head, Kirk telling everybody to remember where they parked. <laughs> Now, The Voyage Home, because of the story, and especially because of the humor and the fish-out-of-water element of the story, it's the most accessible to non-sci-fi or Star Trek fans. Did that enter your mind when you were writing the script? or I don't think much about audiences when I'm writing. The only audience that I'm interested in, at the time anyway, or consciously, is me. I can't possibly second-guess the reactions and opinions of millions of people that I've never met and never will meet. I have to work on a different assumption. And my assumption is, if I like this, other people will like it. 
I could never tell you a joke that I didn't think was funny and hope to get a laugh from you. If, if I don't think it's funny, I'm not going to get the laugh. And so I, I've never really thought about Star Trek fans while writing. I'm not aware. Of I just think about how to make things comprehensible to me. I didn't know anything about Star Trek when I wound up doing what became The Wrath of Khan. So I was sort of making stuff up so that I could understand it or so that my father could understand it. And that's why I started by saying in the 23rd century, because I thought, he's not going to know where the fuck he is. Uh, what's going on? Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, which, of course, in your book, A View from the Bridge, from Viking and Plume Publishing, Undiscovered Country was actually a name for Wrath of Khan before the studio changed it. Correct. Tell us how you got involved in that. Well, I was taken to lunch at Claridge's by Martin Davis and uh, Frank Mancuso, and they because I was living in London at the time, and they said, we don't want to end with uh, this cast on Star Trek V. They were disappointed in the movie, and that's not how they wanted to go out with the original cast. And so they said, would you consider coming on and writing and directing a Star Trek VI movie if you have any ideas? And I said, well, I'll consider it. And then I wound up having a conversation with Leonard uh, Nimoy, and he did have an idea, and that became the plot of Star Trek VI. What's it like being associated with three of the most popular Star Trek films among fans? I don't really know. I just, you know, basically once I got it into my head that Star Trek was Captain Horatio Hornblower in outer space. I just treated it like a submarine movie, I guess. How did you feel about uh, Star Trek Into Darkness basically ripping off Wrath of Khan or remaking it, however you want to put it, and in the eyes of most fans, not well? Well, it is on the one hand, nice to be so successful or beloved or whatever, however you want to describe it, that somebody wants to do an homage to what you did. And I was flattered and, uh, and touched. But in my sort of artistic worldview, if you're going to do an homage, you have to add something. You have to put another layer on and they didn't just by putting the same words in different characters mouths didn't add up to anything and if you have someone dying in one scene and sort of being resurrected immediately after there's there's no there's no real drama going on it just it just becomes a gimmick or gimmicky and that's what i found it to be ultimately this is just one person's opinion, mine, you know. Other people may find it different. But I found it more clever than satisfying. In February of 2016, we got word from The Hollywood Reporter that you were going to be a part of Star Trek Discovery, the new Star Trek series on CBS All Access. Tell us how you got involved with that. Well, I was brought on to it by Brian Fuller, who was the original showrunner. I had never worked on a television series before, so I thought that would be an interesting thing to do, as indeed it, it was. What my contributions to it were are hard to determine because television is really a, is a group effort, and there's so much overlap that I can't either claim or refute credit for the end result because the difference between what is written and gets filmed and what was talked about in conference before things are written is very, very hard to determine with what you would call meaningful or objective precision. 
Now, you said you were brought on by Brian Fuller. Now, is there anything you can tell us about um, why he left or was fired or if that affected your contribution at all when he was gone? Well, I'm not privy to what went on, so I don't know. I do know that Brian was running another show at the same time, American Gods. Um, I don't know what part that played, and I also think it is not particularly appropriate for me to uh, peddle unsubstantiated gossip things that I wasn't privy to, uh, so I or not. Now, this is a question that kind of harkens back to Star Trek IV. And it's kind of a difficult question, but I know you said you don't care too much about smaller details as far as in other interviews when it comes to like Star Trek and certain things like that. And you don't really think about the fans reaction too much ahead of time. But with somebody who's invested in characters as you are as such with like the Holmes novels and uh, time after time. Did it bother you at all that they decided to use quote-unquote colorful metaphors in Star Trek Discovery when they make such a big deal about colorful metaphors in Star Trek IV, obviously need it not being a part of the vernacular anymore? Well, that's, very, that's a very interesting question. That's a huge question. That's the most interesting question, in my opinion, that you ask, and the most difficult to answer. All art is ineluctably the product of the time in which it was created. Mozart doesn't just sound like Mozart. He sounds like mid-European, mid-18th century music. Renoir doesn't just look like Renoir. It looks like 19th century French Impressionist painting. And you could look at movies created in 1923 or 1947 or 1986, and they could all be taking place in the year 1776, for example. But you'd know within five years or five minutes of watching each one of those movies what time it was that they were made in. The fact that a streaming service doesn't have to conform to the same sensor limitations that a network broadcast has to adhere to the fact that we are in a an age in which cuss words are you know proliferating and part of normal speech increasingly leaves very little room for the notion that a new star trek created in, in these conditions was not going to also have colorful metaphors running around but that just seems to come with the territory i'm trying to remember you know if at some point when we were creating it we were using that language or did that come later i my my best recollection and it's, it's entirely fallible is that uh, it didn't occur to me or trouble me at the time, and I didn't think about Star Trek IV. It just it didn't occur to me. But it's a very interesting point. So were you even really that invested in the project at all, or were you somebody they just consulted with from time to time, or what was the extent of your overall participation? I was involved in it for the first year, and I worked on it, I wrote things on it, and then I was not invited for the second year. I don't know why. So I can't really comment because I'm sort of at arm's length from it. And as I say, I don't follow what fans do, so I don't know anything about it. How did Brian leaving and all the controversy affect you? Well, I knew that I knew that when Brian left, I was still on the show, and I and I knew Gretchen and Aaron who came on to you know see if they could save it and I certainly knew Akiva Goldsman I've worked with him and I admire him so I was aware of all that I just wasn't aware of you know once it went on the air that was my involvement with it more or less ended and I'm not a I'm not a chronic Star Trek aficionado I, I bet my, 
this will disappoint your Star Trek readers. <laughs> What can you tell us about the Khan miniseries or films and what's going on with it right now? I was commissioned to write a three-hour or three-night event, and that's what I did. It's called CD Alpha 5, and I don't know the current status. It's, uh, it's been up in the air. Partially, there was a lot of confusion between CBS and there were big upheavals at CBS. And uh, while they sort of didn't know who was in charge, they also didn't know what they were going to do with CD Alpha 5. I'm not exactly sure what's happened. I haven't heard from them in some time. It's very good. It's, it's, it's a terrific uh, trilogy. I think one of the things that's happened is they're not sure that a trilogy is long enough to warrant the um, the cost of doing it is maybe it should you know be something longer or I don't you know I don't know the details of their thinking because I haven't heard them with such a huge catalog of books and films and television shows and movies what are you the most pleased with well there's lots of things that i'm pleased with and some things that i'm less pleased with but i'm enjoying my career i like being a storyteller and i mean some you know things come out better than others movies are like souffles they either rise or they don't and whether they do or they don't it's often very hard to understand why and particularly when they do when they don't you can always say well this didn't work because x we didn't cast it right or didn't shoot it right or i didn't write it right um but when it's something like the wrath of khan or time after time or the day after these things are you know are souffles that rise and you go, well, why, you know, why did it work? And that's harder sometimes to ascertain with any uh, precision. I like the movie of the 7% Solution as well. I take great pride in that. I like my movie Elegy, uh, which I wrote, didn't direct, but I think Elegy is, is one of the best. I think in some empirical sense that the day after was the most worthwhile thing I ever got to do with my life. The thing that I find most gratifying is not that it holds the record as being the most watched television movie ever made in one night, a hundred million people, but more importantly, it was the movie that changed Ronald Reagan's mind about a winnable nuclear war. And Ronald Reagan came to his presidency believing that there was such a thing as a winnable nuclear war. And this is the short version of the story, but after seeing the movie, he went to Reykjavik, met with Gorbachev, signed the Intermediate Range Weapons Treaty, and stopped referring to the Soviet Union as the empire of evil. So I think that's not a bad thing to have on my resume. Maybe I just saved the world. <laughs> Could be right. Is there anything you're working on currently that you're excited about or that you have coming up that you can discuss? Well, there was the Houdini two-night miniseries with Adrian Brody, and there's my television series, which is on Netflix, called The Medici Masters of Florence, which I co-created with Frank Spotnitz. So those are current. Um... Well, I have a book coming out in the fall from St. Martin's Press. It's called The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols. And what's that about? Um, I think I'll hold off on what that one's about. I've given you the title and the publisher. Anyway, it's a, it's a ways off. It's not till October. Uh, and I've been writing a couple of movies on commission, and we'll see what becomes of them. 
I know you're a busy man and you have to get going. I want to thank you so much for your time, unless there was any other projects or anything else you wanted to discuss with us here. No, but thank you for your time and thank you for your questions. I hope uh, my answers are not too boring. No, actually, they were very enlightening, and hopefully we get a chance to talk to you again sometime soon. And we want to encourage our audience to check out your book if they want to learn more about you and your career. And we want to thank you for spending time with us here at Midnight's Edge. Take care. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, we'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini documentaries, special behind the scenes making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.